there was yeah. a magic shop in West Edmonton Mall, the biggest mall in the world. Yeah. They had a magic shop there when I was growing up. I've and, been there. And like, yeah, right? Huge mall. And every few months when my family would end up in the city for a dentist appointment or whatever, we'd go to the mall and I would buy a little trick. I'd save up my allowance and I'd buy a little trick because of what you said. And that is it, it fascinated people. When I was a kid, I, w I felt disempowered, right? Again, the speech impediment, my, my lack of confidence. What magic did for me as a, as a young kid was it gave me a sense of power because I could do something the adults didn't understand, right? I could do this trick and they'd be like, what? 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 Like, what what's this 12-year-old kid doing? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it gave me that yeah. sense of like, this is something cool. And I just learned and I collected just little tricks. Hello, I am John Brink and we are podcasting On The Brink from downtown Prince George, British Columbia, Canada. And for all those people watching us from around the world and saying, okay, we know where Canada is and I believe we know where British Columbia is and we know this big city in British Columbia called Vancouver. So where is Prince George? Well, Prince George is about 500 miles, 800 kilometers north of Vancouver. That puts us physically in the center of British Columbia, north, south, east to west. It is a city of about 80, 90,000 people, 120,000 about in the region. It is nature's paradise. Lots of timber, lots of lakes within 50 miles, probably 100 lakes and then lots of wild and living in harmony with nature we have black bears we have grizzlies we have caribou we have deer you name it we have it today a very very special guest is uh his name is uh derek selinger and derek is a master magician having performed uh, on four continents for millions of people. You can see his work on places like Penn and Teller Fool Us. He is an award-winning filmmaker. He's a speaker, presenter, with a recent TEDx talk about how to dream, how to dream big. We love that. And he has created an immense magical experience which helps 12 people connect in a deeper level. It's called Box of Wonders. Derek, welcome to the show. So great to be here. Thank you for having me. So you have an interesting background because you are now located in central Mexico, but you were born really in the province next to us uh, being in British Columbia. You were born or you came from Alberta. That's right. Yeah, I, I, I'll always, uh, I'll always be a prairie boy, no matter where I end up on this earth. So, were you born in what city? Edmonton. Yeah. So, I'm a big time Edmonton Oilers fan. If you watch, if you watch hockey, I still watch all the games down here. Yeah. And uh, yeah, uh, big hockey fan, and and uh, loved growing up and, and living in Canada. So you got your training and your background there. You started in Edmonton, went to school there, and then, then, what I find so interesting about your bio is that A, you located a long way away from Alberta, but the other one is a master magician. So how did you, how did you, pursue that you didn't go to or oh, let's go to the university and take a course and blah blah, yeah. blah, 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 blah. and then i talked to millions of people around the world <laughs> yeah yeah totally uh, you know it uh originally my my plan was to become a medical doctor so this is uh you know it's a little bit of diver it, right? mom's that's right mom's so proud mom so actually she is proud um I, I often say i'm a soul doctor i'm just a different type of doctor um and, uh, you know, my, my origin story is rather interesting in that um, I, I didn't, I never could have dreamt this could be a career. That, that happened much later. But the, the kind of catalyst to the way that I think and what led me down this path 
happened when I was very young. I was only eight years old. And um, I, I was going through difficult times. I think a lot of kids go through bullying and those types of things. I went through that uh, fairly severely because I had a speech impediment. So I couldn't form words properly. I was had to go to speech pathology uh, uh, clinic to try and get my mouth to work correctly. I also had a bit of dyslexia. So uh, I was having difficulty learning. I was having difficulty relating to kids. And I was just really struggling. And my mom saw this. And she picked that time to tell me this story. She sat me down at the table. She said, Derek, I... I need to tell you that you're, you are special. Uh, all, all kids are special, but I want to tell you why you're special. And she told me this story that when she was pregnant with me, she was electrocuted or shocked. She didn't die, but she grabbed 220 volts of live electricity in the house. Oof. And it almost, yeah, it's like, like big jolt, not like a little Oof. 110. It was like 220, no, no. the stove plug live could, it almost kill, killed her could kill you right yeah very, in fact it's a miracle it didn't the only reason it didn't is because she had just mopped the floor and so it was slippery and so it kicked her feet up so she didn't ground to become a become a circuit herself right right, right. um she was rushed to the hospital and in the hospital they they said to her, we think you're going to be okay but we don't know what your baby and she was like what <laughs> what are yeah. you talking about they're like you're pregnant she didn't even know no you're pregnant first trimester of pregnancy it's the most vulnerable time for a fetus like it's not going to survive no and if it does survive it will most certainly not be normal right which is true which is yeah. true i am not normal <laughs> no, i'm not normal either you're a genius <laughs> right, right. Well, I mean, I got, the, I mean, that actually led to my next thought, right? Because at eight years old, my mom tells me this story. I had two very distinct thoughts. The first is that I have superpowers, right? Like, yes. I was electrocuted. I have yeah. to have some kind of like, mm, I tried to fly. I jumped off the bed like multiple times trying to, it, it didn't work. Didn't work, um, no. But the, but that was a very profound thought. Like I have superpowers. The second thought uh, was that my life is a gift. The fact that I'm alive today is miraculous. It's amazing. It's tremendous. Um, and I need to make the most out of this gift I've been given. That's a profound thought for an eight-year-old. Right. You know. And um, you know, I know that's what your podcast is about as well. And, 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 you know, I think off the top, the thing I want to say to anybody listening is hopefully you have not had a near death experience or almost been electrocuted <laughs> before birth, but the same is true for everybody listening to this podcast. Your life is a gift. The fact that your life is tremendous. It's miraculous. It's amazing. And we get the opportunity to make the most out of this gift. You know, what, what an amazing thing. Yeah. So that thought was part of my mindset all the way through my adolescence. And I think it is a big reason why I ended up performing this art because the art of magic is all about experiencing wonder, experiencing the joy of life brand new, especially as adults, because we forget, we forget what it means to be uh, a kid, what it means to dream, what it means to appreciate life because we get so busy and so caught up in, in the rest of life. So that became kind of the baseline to what I do. And, and this was at eight, you know, and this developed then this feeling of being a superpower in a sense because of nearly being killed by yep. electricity. Yep. Is that, so where did you go from there to, you went through your schooling and at what time did you believe that performing in, in front of hundreds yeah. and thousands of people and millions, uh, you know, that magic would be the one that you specialized in? Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, you know, the, f the first thing I'll say is when you hear someone performing in front of millions of people or feeling comfortable to jump on a podcast and have a conversation, you may think, oh, that person is really talented. But the truth is, is I learned all this, right? 
when I was a kid, I was super shy. I, w I had a speech impediment. I was nervous to be in front of people. I had to learn to overcome these fears and develop these skills. And they are learnable. All, all of the stuff we can learn. Like, it's not, it, we're not, uh, you know, locked out of all of these different arenas. So through my adolescence, I, I, I was involved in many different things that kind of stretched my boundaries. But uh, it wasn't until I was working for a university. I actually went through university. I, I, my initial track was, like I said, I was going to be a medical doctor. So I, I started going through a process. I got an undergrad degree. And at the end of my undergrad degree, um, I just wasn't feeling the medicine route. So I was thinking about what else I would do. And I got a job at a university being in charge of the residence program and coaching college basketball. And I loved it. It was, it was the best job. I loved it so much. As I was doing that job, one of my hobbies was magic. Yeah, I, I had that hobby for many years. And and I would just perform magic tricks for the students to try and break the ice. That's all. Why? It was just but something did you, I did. Where did you get this from? Did you, did you the magic? see some? Yeah. You know, the, yeah. Be, because I thought about that too when I was a kid, actually. But I want to hear it from you. Is because something triggered me. And, and it was very simple stuff that uh, not complicated. And, and, and people liked it. And, and, yeah. uh, but, but where do you, and it always kind of stayed with me in a way, but how did it start there and then went forward? Yeah. Like, well, I mean, I, I grew up in a small town in right. the prairies of Canada. There were no right. magicians in my town. Right. So it wasn't like I went to a birthday and saw a magician and went, oh, that's no. cool. The magicians no. I saw were on TV. Yeah. Right. It was David Copperfield. It was those guys doing crazy yeah. stuff. Yeah. I never in a million years believed that like that could be me, but there was yeah. a magic shop in West Edmonton mall, the biggest mall in the world. Yeah. They had a magic shop there when I was growing up. I and, mean, that. and like, yeah, right. Huge mall. And every few months when my family would end up in the city for a dentist appointment or whatever, We'd go to the mall and I would buy a little trick. I'd save up my allowance and I'd buy a little trick because of what you said. And that is it, it fascinated people. When I was a kid, I, w I felt disempowered, right? Again, the speech impediment, my, my lack of confidence. What magic did for me as a, as a young kid was it gave me a sense of power because I could do something the adults didn't understand, right? I could do this trick and they'd be like, what? What? Like, what what's this happened? 12 year old kid doing? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it gave me that yeah. sense of like, this is something cool. And I just learned and I collected just little tricks, little oddities that would allow me to break the social ice with people. And that's how I treated it at that time. I never, ever dreamt it could be an art form I could pursue. I thought it was just something neat that I did, but that's kind of the origin there. Where did you find the tricks? Because I, as a kid, I went through that, but you can't find them. You yeah. can't buy a book and say, here's a book of tricks. This is the way you do it. That's how you do it. Because everybody's very secretive about saying, no, I'm not going to talk about that. No, no, no. Right. Yeah, so. Right. Well, actually, uh, the truth is, and I didn't discover books until I was old, but the magicians have this funny joke. It's an old joke, but it's, it's this idea that Magicians hide their secrets in the place that people will never look. Exactly. In books, because the public don't read. <laughs> so that's the joke. Um, and there's actually like a tremendous amount of literature written about magic and about learning magic. Like, tremendous. Now, when I was young, I, I didn't know about the books. I just went to this little magic shop in West Hampton Mall and I'd buy the trinkets. Right. right. The self-working things, the props. Right. Um, not the best way to learn magic because it doesn't actually teach you skills, but it was a good start. When I got older and I was in college, then I discovered books and that's when everything took off. So when I listen to you, a couple of observations, you're a very good speaker mm. and, oh, and, thank you. And, and, and that means you have confidence. And then at the same time, you have a lot of similarities to me. Uh, uh, I was born in 
uh, November the 1st, 1940. So I will be 84 this year. Congratulations. Fantastic. Well, thank you. you look great. Uh, I say 84 years young. And, and then uh, I'm very much into uh, quality of life and fitness and all of those kind of mm -hmm. things. But that was during the Second World War. The, when I was born, the war, the Hitler had invaded Western Europe and things were not good and uh, things were very, very tough and very, very difficult. I still remember mm -hmm. as a kid, being three to three and a half years old, hundreds of bombers overhead bombing Allied mm. forces bombing the German infrastructure they were building uh, and we were living in northeastern Holland. So uh, my mom, my dad was drafted into the Dutch Air F uh, Army uh, in, in May of 1940 and for five years they wouldn't know if he was dead or alive. The last time he was seen was in downtown Rotterdam before it was bombed and it killed thousands of people. So I remember that part of that when I was uh, three, three and a half years old, hundreds of bombers overhead. The sound is something you will never hear again, but uh, my mom would take us outside uh, because she felt safer outside in, in the evenings than inside. And in the distance, we could see the cities burning, the sky would be red. The other thing that I remember from that period is that uh, you know, was the winter uh, in this 1944-45. Uh, it was the hunger year in particular, and uh, because they had cut off all the food. And uh, as kids, uh, my brother, my sister, myself, they were two and three years older than me. We would go with gunny sacks into the railroad yard, pick up anything edible and burnable. And then, uh, you know, and I can still feel the feeling of hunger even now, 80 years later. And then the other part was that, uh, as I said earlier, April the 12th, 1945, we were liberated by the Canadian Army. And I, I, it made such an impression on me that I always knew from that point forward, I would go to Canada, the land of my heroes. And I was gonna mm -hmm. go when I was 17, but I was drafted in the Dutch Air Force. And then I did go when I was 23. Now, the other part about me where we have similarities is uh, I, I discovered a lot after I came to Canada in 1965, 32 years later, uh, I was not very successful academically. I failed grade three and I failed grade seven three times. And, uh, and, and uh, uh, you know, the, and kids are hard on each other and the kids that mm. I went to school with, uh, uh, they went on to college and university and I became a laborer. Uh, at 13, I worked in a furniture factory, and, but I loved it. And, uh, and, and uh, my grandfather was a master carpenter. And so my dream became to go to Canada and then build my own lumber mill. That was my dream, mm. you know, and to prove to me that I could do it. I was here already for 32 years when I walked into a store, and you may f find this interesting, and I picked up a book, and the actual book that I picked up in January 1997 is this book, Driven to Distraction. And the book was written by Dr. Hollywell, medical doctor, uh, has written about 18 books, five of them on distraction. He is ADHD and dyslexic. Mm. And, mm. and so the more I saw of the book, the more I said to myself, oh my God, that's me. I'm ADHD. Mm. And I wrote in the book here, now I finally, in Dutch, because I was ashamed of it, now I finally know who I am. And uh, that mm. was written January 1997. So mm. I am ADHD and, uh, and dyslexic. And uh, so, uh, but Regardless of that, all my dreams of building a mill, I did that and did a whole number of other things, writing books. I'd done four of those and then working on two other ones. I call ADHD, it took me a while to figure out what it was and Google. And then it took me five years before I went to my doc that delivered our two daughters and was a personal friend. And, and, and I said to, and I was 62 then, I said to him, he said, why are you here, John? I said, I think I've got ADHD. And so we checked it out and yes, I do. 
So the more I found out about it, the more I find that it is a superpower. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, you know, the, and I started speaking about it and doing presenting. And then I wrote a book about it, ADHD Unlocked, very popular actually. And, uh, you know, so the other part that I did, Dr. Halliwell, that uh, wrote this book in 1993, and I bought it in 1997. I had him on, your podcast number is 299, nearly 300. Awesome. And, and I did a podcast with Dr. Halliwell on the brain 203. And, uh, you know, so, and it was, was unique. <laughs> Uh, you know, he was on my podcast. So as we were talking about ADHD in particular, is that from all the things that I had found out about it and in my own experience, is that initially I believed that about 8% of the population likely ADHD. I found then that it was more than that. So I suggested to Dr. Halliwell, and he's the expert, not me, that I believed that it probably be more like 20%. Mm-hmm. He said, no, John, mm-hmm. it's more than 25%. And I agree with them. And it's both equal likely between males and females. I agree with them on that too, although it is different how it presents itself in females that it does in males. And then the other thing that I found unique about it is that and all the things that I've done and all the organizations I've been involved in and all the companies and all the boards and all of that kind of stuff is that I believe that most of the successful entrepreneurs and CEOs, I suggested to Dr. Halliwell that from my experience, I believe that 50% of them are likely ADHD. He said, no, John, mm-hmm. 75%. And I wow. agree with him. So for me, uh, uh, you know, then from that point forward, a whole lot of things happened and changed in my life at a very later part of life, in my late 60s, already in my 70s, that I started writing mm-hmm. books. And then now I've done four, I'm working on two other ones that come out next year. I have 10 different companies. And then I'm obviously a very active uh, podcast. I do a lot of speaking engagement. And so what I have found is that ADHD is a superpower. Once you have the ability to understand how it works and what makes me different from other people. But first and foremost, what it did, it gave me confidence. And, and again, that is critical. And same as you were saying, uh, Derek, is uh, you done presentation in front of thousands and hundreds of thousands of people. And, and I, we all have the same fear. Uh, as they say, uh, the most difficult thing for a lot of people is to they sooner die than present in front of a group of people. I had the same issue. And, uh, uh, you know, and I, I was, uh, until by coincidence, somebody suggested I should go to Toastmasters in 1990, which I did. And, and I said, what do they, why do you go there? Why, why would you want me to go there? He said, just sit there and just watch it. And I said, okay, they're not going to ask me something. He said, no. Halfway through the meeting, somebody said, hey, John, explain to us who you are. And I said, oh, my God, I'll never go back here. But I did. I stayed there for 10 years and I became a distinguished Toastmaster, which is the highest level. And, and so uh, that, again, coincidental, as you explained about your journey between the warriors, liberation by the Canadians, the decision to go to Canada, then failing the traditional learning system, having to learn things myself, as I did, as you did, uh, then came to Canada to prove to me, not to anybody else, to me, that I was just as good, not better than, but just as good. And so starting from nothing, and when I came to Canada in July of 1965, 
I landed in Montreal, took the train across Canada, four days, five nights. God, that is a long way to go. And as you well know, in, in any event, arrived in Vancouver, once in the immigration office, and, and couldn't speak English, didn't know a soul, didn't have a job. And fortunately, there was a German fellow, so I, and, and I told him what I wanted to do. I wanted to build a lumber mill. He said, Prince George, that's where you want to go. 1965, it's a boom town. They're building lumber mills, and that's where the opportunities are. So I took the Greyhound bus 13 hours to Prince George, came out the bus. I can still see where it stopped here. And I came out the bus, had my suitcase, three books, two sets of clothes, and I counted my money at least three times, and I had exactly $25.47. But I had a dream to build a lumber yeah. mill. And so uh, started off as a cleanup man and blah, 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 and all that kind of stuff. And then within a year and a half, I was the superintendent of all the largest mills here. And then after about 10 years, I started uh, uh, the brain group of companies and so now I'm involved in lumber as one silo, uh, warehousing uh, distribution in another one and then uh, real estate, uh, uh, residential, uh, commercial and industrial and then media is another one of my silos where I do books, speaking and uh, working on a platform actually. So that's kind of my background but the understanding ADHD for me and being dyslectic, I also do audios on all my books. It takes me longer than most other people, but uh, mm -hmm. I do it. And, and kind of looking back is that what drives me in a way is that's why I'm doing the books and doing a lot of other stuff. It was 50 years ago, when virtually 50 years ago, that I failed the traditional schooling system and it took me to that time to become knowledgeable about the fact that I had ADHD and what it really meant and that in my mind it's an asset, not a liability and potentially a superpower if you understand what it does and the potential that it has. So that kind of puts me where we are today. So we have a number of similarities is that uh, I'm, I'm a very good speaker, very good presenter. It was because of ADHD, uh, of uh, a, possibly ADHD and the other one, uh, Toastmasters, is that in all the years that I've been involved in Toastmasters, I've seen many, many people that uh, started uh, uh, and had fear of being uh, you know, involved in that part. I've never seen anybody that was as fearful as me to go to the first. I could have crawled out of there, but I didn't. And, and so, and then it brought me to it gave me that confidence and it comes back to what you were saying is that I'm a can-do individual. Everything is possible and then the other part that I've learned and now nearly 84 that as I do presentation to young people in particular but also other ones is that you are special. There's only one of you and that does not mean that you're better than but, uh, you know, two people are, are too preoccupied and this is wrong and that is wrong and all the other things. No, no, there's only one of you and everything is possible. Love it. Yeah, thank you. That being uh, told that I'm similar to someone that survived, uh, you know, World War II is a very high compliment. Uh, that's quite the story, my friend. Yeah. So, at, at, and if you look back, and as you did, uh, you know, the small town in Alberta, and the things that changed you, or were the triggers to what you became, mm -hmm. and you're immensely successful in the things that you're doing, you uh, are a very effective presenter, and all those things, you look back to the things that happened along the way, a mother that believed in you where others maybe wouldn't have, and all those things became triggers to what you would become. And, and so, what I'm hoping is that, and you probably feel the same as I do, the reason that I'm sitting here and that I'm podcasting, I believe, a deep believer in podcasting because what I used to do in presenting, a lot of times, as you well know, if I do presenting 
and I do it, uh, I'm going to do a presentation actually in Alberta uh, with the ADHD group in, in the Alberta. Uh, uh, I do that because I feel so strongly about ADHD and I want to do that for them, but it usually takes me two days. Mm -hmm. At the same time, I'm very active in podcasting and it took time for us to discover that virtual is just as effective there you sitting in central Mexico, I'm sitting in central British Columbia, and we are sitting here like you're sitting with me on the couch, exchanging our live stories. And in the meantime, Derek, as you well know, tens of thousands of people are watching us. Mm -hmm. And it's only at That's its infancy, it's just at the beginning. A after 299 episodes, I, I love your story because like you, as you've, as you've so aptly said, uh, things that we often count as disadvantages can become an advantage. And in our v deeply, um, you know, we're so we're so interested in comparing ourselves to others. I think it's a natural thing. But um, what you, what you, you know, your story is really stuck with me and inspired me is this idea that the thing that looks like might hold you back may be the thing that sets you free and sets you apart. And uh, I just love that. I love that. So tell us more about you in terms of there you go from small town, showing people, being at the university uh, and, and being involved in basketball and then and saying to yourself, likely, Derek, where do we go from here? And then where it ended up is in now you're presenting around the world to millions mm -hmm. of people on magic. So you have become very, very unique, but you're also a very effective presenter. And, and I can see that you have confidence, which means that for me, what was important is that it took me a long time until I understood that I was equality, not necessarily better than, but it's something that ADHD likely has helped me. Being dyslectic uh, has always been an issue, still is an issue. So if I do audio on my books, it takes me longer and that's fine. And uh, you know, so, but I don't look at it as a liability, but sharing with other people that you can do as well, meaning in a general sense for those people watching us, it's saying, well, I'm this, I'm that, and the other thing. No, everything is possible. If you can do it, uh, Derek, uh, uh, then, and I can do it, then anybody can do it. Yeah, hundred percent. You know, the idea of confidence is such an interesting idea because like the root of confidence is confide, right? So what confidence is, is the story that you tell yourself and believe, right? So when you when you confide in yourself a story that is um, negative and tells you you can't, guess what? That's going to be the truth. <laughs> That's going to exactly. be a reality. But when <clears throat> but when you tell yourself a story that you can, that this is possible, that you can you can make it happen, and you begin to believe that story, you begin to carry it, like. And and there's there's very practical ways to do this. Like I'll tell you the story of my first show. Okay, my first stage show. I like I was doing tricks for friends. It was just fun, you know, little little things here and there. But when I was working for the university, they had like a student experience weekend, and students came from all over the place to see the university. And I had this idea: why don't I do a magic show for some of the students? And so I talked to the you know the people in charge. They're like, yeah, you should do it. That, that's great. We'll even pay you a little money. You'll do it in the auditorium. I said, how many people? They said 50 to 70 people. I'm like, I could do that. I could do that. I know I could do it. So I, I made a show and it's showtime. And, I, and I'm ready to go. And I'm waiting backstage and the MC comes back and says, we got a couple more people than 50. And I said, oh yeah, like 70, 75. He's like, no, 500. Oh, and I was like, my friend, I was so afraid. I yeah. was terrified. 500, these are teenagers, right? Teenagers. So I'm going to do magic for 500 teenagers. They're going to kill me. They're going to yeah. eat me alive. 
so uh anyway i i wanted to run away and hide but (laughs) i i said i'd do it they're there i went out and i performed fortunately i didn't completely suck thank thank you god for that you know like um i i I actually still have the footage and i have to tell you it yes it look i wasn't good no but i wasn't bad like i was i was okay i was good enough for them not to boo me (laughs) okay so i do this show and i get to the end and the, the students were so kind to me they applauded and I walked off that stage and I, f- I felt like I was going to die. Like I just, my anxiety, all that. I said to myself, I never want to feel that again, ever. That was the worst feeling, that anxiety, that pressure. I hated it so much. So I had a choice. Choice one was to avoid it. Yeah. To avoid, because at the same time, I loved performing the magic. That was fun. I just didn't like the feeling of anxiety. Yeah. So the first option was to avoid it. Yeah. This, and I thought to myself, well, I still want to do this. So what's the second option? The second option was I started to go to restaurants and I, I, I make a deal with the restaurant where I would perform for people while they were sitting waiting through for their food. Right. And I would just perform for a couple or a family and I would do magic at their table. And at first this scared me too, a less than the stage but it still scared me. Yeah. But over time, it scared me less and less and less. And the story I told myself that you are good at this began to grow and, and other people started telling me that story. And that added to my confidence, my confidence. Exactly. And guess what? After six months, I wasn't afraid anymore. No. I wasn't afraid anymore. And now I could step on stage and I'd still feel a bit of it, but not yeah. as much. Yeah. And. And, uh, you know, when I, when I stepped on, the first time I stepped on uh, uh, television, on, on live international television in front of millions of people, the same feeling was there. I was like, <gasps> but guess what? I had trained myself. I had done this so many times that yeah. I was able to tell myself the true story that I can do this. And really, I believe that's the key to confidence. It's like, it, it's like how you go ahead. Yeah. It's exactly that, uh, Derek. I get so excited about listening to you that <laughs> I interrupt you. But that's, no, that's the fine. whole key, you know, because you know, as I do, and, and that I may get a sense of anxiety if I present, uh, you know, then, but I know that I can do it, that nothing will happen that I cannot deal with, and that gives me that confidence, but to have a sense of anxiety in, in front of a large group of people or certain settings is normal and, and because it gives me the ability to make it good and special, it drives me up to that maximum. But I know deep down I can do it. Exactly. And, and I, you know, I see the, your, your book in the background, Liv- Living Young, Dying Old. I'm, I'm certain in that book you talk about weight training, right? Yeah. You talk yeah. about the importance of weight training. Well, if somebody were to walk into a gym and they're like, I know I need to weight train, they're not going to sit down and try and bench 200 pounds first day. That would be insane, right? You would, you'd hurt yourself, right? Exactly. And I think a lot of people, because again, we're in this comparative world, we look at people who are accomplished speakers or famous people and we go, oh, I could never do that. Well, that would be like comparing yourself to a person that has worked out their whole life and could just throw weights, right? Exactly. That's insane. You do what you did, which is find something like Toastmasters, which is basically a speaking gym. You find a place where you can start lifting light weights and just go, well, what if I spoke to two or three people? And all of us in all of our jobs, whether you're working the simplest of job or the most complex job, you have to convey ideas to people. These are places you can begin to train your ability, your confidence in being exactly. able to present and get stronger at it. Exactly. And, and that is the key, right? So the, uh, you yes. have to do it one step at a time. So, so when did you go now to, now you become international. So you work with, you have an agency of somehow that makes the, creates those connections internationally. How does that all work? Yeah, that, 
Yeah, that's right. Um, I, in in my line of work, there are, are agents and speaker bureaus all over the world that have my information that if you wanted to hire me, you could go to them and they'll source me. That's quite often where a lot of work comes in. Um, the, uh, you know, during, right before COVID um, hit, we, we were on Penn and Teller's Fool Us on the television show and we were, we were touring a show. And I was actually, I was gonna come to your city. Um, we, were, we were touring a show throughout Canada and the United States and COVID hit and it canceled uh, everything. It canceled our tour. Yeah. I lost hundreds of thousands of dollars on venue rentals on marketing and then lost revenue. Um, it, it was, of course, a disaster for us all, but you know, right. for people in the entertainment industry, it's everything, everything's gone. Yeah. So everything disappears for me. It's Which gone. And I had, yeah. And, and that's just it. Like the first year it's like, okay, you kind of go in a holding pattern. You're like, okay, we'll come out of this in six months. Okay. Yeah. Eight months. Okay. Yeah. A year at a year it became clear we're doing this another year you yeah, know i yeah. i can't do this another year i can't yeah. so my wife and i made the decision uh for my mental health and my creative health to relocate here to mexico uh where things were a little slower a little more tranquil um and we we moved here and i instead of moping and feeling sorry for myself which would have been very easy I decided to get radically creative. I got extremely creative. I wrote a book. I wrote a TEDx talk. I wrote two new shows, one of which became the show that you mentioned at the beginning called Box of Wonders. And it's a complete right. divergent. Like normally, um, you know, I perform in front of thousands of people in front right. of, you know, in a theater. But I thought to myself, how could I be of best service to people? It's, it's the ability to connect in a very real and tangible format. So I created right. an experience for 12 people. We sit around a table. I t it's very interesting because it's a lot of what you've been doing in this podcast. I tell stories about our history. I help right. us remember, and I, I perform <clears throat> mind blowing magic for the purpose of having people reconnect to their history and therefore their creativity. That's the whole purpose of the show. Right. Um, we, we developed a business model for it that is very, very different because 12, I mean, listen, performing for a thousand people, you're gonna make more money than 12. That's just obvious. Right. But we, uh, we started to perform this for executive teams to help them unlock their creative potential as executive teams and for uh, clients that really wanted to connect to a specific group of people, whether that's friends or family. So this, this show, this expression, which is like, if I were, it's my masterwork. If I were to stand on stage in Carnegie Hall and play a violin virtuoso, th it would be this show. Right. Um, this show doesn't happen without the disruption of the pandemic. It doesn't right. happen because I never no. think in this direction. So it's exa again, an example of what you, what you illustrated earlier, that the thing that was meant to kill you could become your, your superpower. And now exactly. the thing that I'm becoming best known for was the thing I would never have imagined three years ago. No, and, and, and so that has changed everything for you. Yes, yes, big time. I mean, I still perform on stage, I love it, but I'm doing it less. And the reason yeah. I'm doing it less is because I wanna do Box of Wonders more. It's a decision. Yeah. And, and so how do you see now your career going forward? It's the location, is a good one uh, where you are. Do you do virtual as well uh, using the internet? Right. Um, I, 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 mean, I use I use uh, uh, the internet, you know, for podcasts and, and making right. videos. During COVID, we did some performing through virtual, uh, you know, Zoom and whatnot. Uh, it was okay. It yeah. wasn't great, uh, and it's because magic is more believable when you see it and you can yeah. touch it and when yeah. you know when it's right now i mean zoom has advantage like this right here this is the world's smallest deck of cards i don't know if you can see it do you add yeah. water oh my god did you see that <laughs> how did you do that <laughs> i feel better now i've been holding that in <laughs> oh my god oh my god i find that amazing thank you thank you so, I mean, oh. there are advantages because the camera's right here and everybody that's watching this instead of listening this will have seen that right on their screen. 
But when I sit with people and I'm able to look into their eyes and and stay connected to them, something really amazing happened. And I think that's the thing with Box of Wonders is I realized I needed to be a part of helping people come back together after the pandemic to remember right. what it means to be together in physical form. Right. Um, so how do I see my career going? Um, you know, Box of Wonders, I think, is taking over a large portion of what I do where uh, I'm doing that more and more. I'm speaking to, I'm still speaking to groups. I'm still performing, but I'm doing that more and more. I'm writing a book uh, that is inspired by my TEDx talk, which was about the importance and power of dreaming big. So I'm writing a book about that. I'm going to follow in your footsteps. I'm, I'm, I'm inspired to write one book and you've written, what, four or more. That's amazing. Um, so I'm going to write that. I wrote a fiction book last year. So my, my future uh, is going to involve a lot of travel because Box of Wonders is a live show. I go to people, to, their, to where they live, to their homes. I literally am doing it in, in people's homes. And it's just so powerful. But that means that my wife and I travel a lot. And that's why we love where we live. We live close to a really good airport. It's, we're easily accessible everywhere in North America. And we come back to this with tremendous beauty and tranquility, much like where you're in, in central BC. Yeah, so that's another thing. Uh, so your wife and yourself working closely together and, and yes. go, going virtually in places together as well. Yes. And, and so d then, so what you're, uh, business model looks like is mainly North America or do you go beyond that? Yeah, we have, I've, I've performed in Europe a bunch before COVID. We haven't taken Box of Wonders to Europe yet. You know, I will say the, the one thing that virtual has been great for, I do very select coaching. I, I don't have a big program. Right. I take a couple executive clients a year and I help them work on their, uh, what we did today, their origin story and their triumph story. I help them develop their stories for communication. Um, so virtually that's great. But, um, uh, but as far as going to Europe, yeah, we're, we will definitely go to Europe. We, I, 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 performed in, I performed in Holland actually, uh, back in the day. In, you in did? The <laughs> yeah, yeah. In The Hague. Yeah, in The Hague. Yeah, yeah. And, very popular. And, uh, tremendous country, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, the, totally. uh, the Hague is one of the biggest cities in Holland. Mm -hmm. You know, so the, the other thing, I just want to come back to uh, the, uh, it's called the Box uh, of Wonders, is that what you're saying about it, uh, uh, and he has created an, immer immer uh, an, an immersive, magical experience, helps tall people mm -hmm. connect in a deeper level. You, you can uh, uh, notice my dys dyslexia, I'm not good at reading the things. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I get so, it, man. I get it. It's all good. So, so what, uh, what is it exactly? You say, and so explain it to yeah. us again. 12 people connecting in a deeper level. So That's what, who, would, who, who is the one that looks at saying, okay, let's hire Derek Salinger and, and, yeah. and make a presentation. What yeah. are they There's expecting th and how does it work? That, that, I, very, it's very kind of you to ask. Thank you. Um, there's, there's two kind of use cases that have born out of this show. The first is a, um, a person that wants to have the ultimate dinner party to connect to their friends and family on a deeper level. And we've done a bunch of those where the, you know, it's like a group of people that you know, that you love, but you want to know better. Right. The second group is the corporate environment where uh, the, you know, the executive team of a corporation needs to connect better for a purpose, and that purpose is creativity. So both veins play out slightly different. How we always begin, though, is with a meal, is the group comes together and they, they break bread together. There's something about eating together. We've forgotten yeah. how to do that. So right. 12 people around a table, they, they, they have a meal, and I'm not even in the room yet, but I give the host a card with a question and everybody goes around the, the, the table and answers that question. And what it does is it lubricates their imagination and starts getting them engaged with each other and each other's stories. At the end of the meal, the, everything's cleared away and I come in and I perform 90 minutes of the most mind-blowing magic and mentalism that you've ever seen in your life. It is my masterwork. It, 
things change places. I know things I shouldn't know. Um, things float. Th you know, it's like mind blowing stuff that you can't believe is happening in front of you and in your hands and to your friends. It's incredible. Give I'm me so an proud example. of it. Give me an example. Uh, yeah. So, um, uh, an, an example would be, uh, here, here's a great example. It, you know, some of it, I don't want to do the do the spoilers because the end of this show comes together in this like moment where like all of our stories converge in this prediction that i made at the beginning but like one thing i do which is really fun you'll appreciate this is everybody brings a small object that okay. is meaningful to, to them like an avatar and right. they put it into a bag at a point in the show and i don't see them they don't see each other's objects no and then what i do is i go through these objects one at a time and discern who owns which object by looking at body language and looking at the object and just doing like a live real time read of these people. And, and what I'm trying to do is learn their story with this object. And I'm very accurate. It's very, very accurate. Um, How do and it's you do like, it? I know, right? It's, it's like, <laughs> that's, the whole that's exactly right. People yeah. are like, what? And you know, I do I do some traditional stuff with cards. I do a little right. bit of cards. I, I do some like some very dangerous stuff at the table that you're like, oh my gosh, that's so dangerous, but it's it's not. Don't worry, I don't hurt myself. Right. Right. Um, so this 90 minute performance, the whole idea around it is that um, the most magical thing we possess is our memory. Right. Um, however, our memory sometimes is is not reliable. Right. That's why we need each other. Because when we right. remember together, our memories become much stronger. So that's the show. We get right. to this concluding moment where it's like people are like blown away. Then, then depending on which group it is, if it's the, um, the social group, what happens is we serve drinks, we have drinks and, and some, some dessert, and we just talk. We just talk about our memories. I, people end up sharing things. It happens spontaneously. I, I nudge ever so slightly, but people just start, share. they ask me questions kind of like you are. And we have this amazing conversation that brings the evening to a conclusion. And what happens over and over, over again as we performed it is the people don't want to leave. They feel so connected to the moment in each other. They don't want to leave the room. It's so beautiful. In the executive team, it's more intentional. What I do is very specifically talk about the creative process, what it takes to create, how we start with an idea and a dream and we move it to goals, but a goal is not, a, anyway, it's this, it's my, my philosophy of creativity and it's to help executive teams be creative in the chaos because we've got a lot of chaos, right? Now. So right. it's very practical for the executive team, for the, uh, the social group, it's a lot looser and a little more airy and light, but they both have deep meaning. So I'm a CEO of hypothetically mm -hmm. speaking of a yes. major company and my executive team, operational team, and having all kinds of friction and issues because of right. what you were saying, is saying, now somebody suggested to me but I would do it, think about bringing in a person that uh, has, uh, they call it the box of wonders, that bring together a whole different dynamics in your group. Exactly, and, it's asymmetrical and, corporate training, yeah. And, and so I say, oh, okay. So then once we have all the details figured out, then saying, what is the objective likely is saying, if I were the one that pushed the button on this, then saying, but mm -hmm. the objective that I would have is to bring people closer together as an executive team so that we can then look at uh, what we heard from Derek Seliger is that at the end, they will remember him and there is certain elements that will help us as a team working closer together and resolving issues and problems. Exactly right. And, you know, in the executive team scenario, the, the third phase is actually collaborative. So I get the CEO or manager sitting next to me 
and uh, this is this is pre cued um, is slightly where they express in in loose terms what they're experiencing and ask how I go through create creating new magic and as I talk about the creative process because it's a it's a system that I follow as I talk about the system then he applies it to his team so it's not me making the application I'm the whole point of this is not about how great Derek is look how amazing he is look how talented no no no, no. the whole point is to empower the individual to use the power of memory and connectedness to their advantage and to empower the executive to direct the energy of chaos around them down creative pathways. They do that. I just give them the tool. And that's precisely the key, right? That's yeah. what you, that's what the box of wonders is all about. That at the that's end, right. he will provide the management tool that will change his management team and simply you showing them the tool to his team and they will remember it and the mind, shed, uh, the mind will change and he guides through all of those things. Yeah, the problem we, you know, we have when we go to conferences, we, you know, you've been to millions of conferences and you hear great presentations. They're really yeah. good. There's yeah. good information, but we forget it so fast, you know? So we have, to cr we have to think asymmetrically. We have to think differently about how to make ideas stick. This is my solution to that. And as I know that you have, that's exactly what you're doing with your podcasts, right? Is trying to make things stick. And then the other part, if I make presentations, a lot of times what I say, people will not remember, they will not necessarily remember the presentation, but they will never, never forget me being there presenting right. it and so that's, and right. that's what i do is i just don't stand there and read it off no they, it's it's yes. me <laughs> being there they will remember that part right that's right that's right yeah Derek, i you know yeah go ahead sorry i interrupted you i was gonna i was about to say that uh being on this podcast and watching uh how you're crushing it at 84 is giving me so much inspiration i i i often say you know my friends are like when are you gonna you know what's your end game when when does this finish i'm like they're gonna have to drag me off stage i am never quitting like never they will I have to it. literally remove me right exactly. and i hear i see you at 84 crushing it i'm like that's gonna be me at 84 <laughs> I, i'm gonna be this guy i love it here he is <laughs> So, so uh, the, I want to send you some of my books, but they have, they have to go all the way to Mexico? No, actually, uh, I, I go back to Canada fairly often. Uh, we'll talk. I'll give you my sister's address. I love it. Okay, let's, let's make sure we do that. And let's stay in touch, Derek. This was Please. an amazing this. podcast and, uh, and amazing knowing you and getting to know you and, and our friendship will last from beyond this and we'll stay in touch. You betcha. Thank you so much. Thanks, Derek. Take care.